Good morning. This is the Lou Rockwell Show, and how great to have as our guest this morning, Sibel Edmonds. Sibel is an extraordinary person, a, a very brave person, uh, a very principled person, somebody who uh, was hor horrifically oppressed by the U.S. government. Uh, she hasn't let that stop her. Take a look at her website, Boiling Frogs Post. Uh, she's the author of Classified Woman, the Sibel Edmonds story, where she tell, I'm going to ask her to tell us a little bit about what the government did to her previously, but we're here to talk today especially about her new novel, The Lone Gladio. Now, who knew that Sibel was going to be a thriller writer? But it's quite wonderful, and it's an exciting novel. It's a truth-telling novel. It's what uh, in the old days they would have called a Romana Clef, because in an uh, increasingly authoritarian society all throughout history, uh, people have had to use novels to tell the truth when they couldn't uh, actually do it in the in the guise of nonfiction. But Sibel, tell us first of all, you know, and I know this is a very long topic, but what did the government do to you? Why did they do it? Why didn't you buckle? As you know, the ACLU classified me as the most classified gag woman in the history of the United States. Yes. That's because I have received most number of gag orders and the uh, invocation of state secrets privilege repeatedly. In fact, even the congressional hearings and investigation on my case were all stopped by the Justice Department through retroactive classification invocation and the state secrets privilege invocation. Uh, I worked for less than a year for the FBI as a language specialist. You speak four languages. You're, you actually know foreign languages, unlike the people who work in the FBI normally. <laughs> Right. And because of that, even though I was initially hired as a language specialist, I ended up working with counterintelligence FBI agents as an analyst because they did not have any analyst, the FBI, the entire organization, who knew the area. And this is Central Asia Caucasus and all the former Soviet countries, the language is uh, Turkic language. And Turkish is my primary language, but I also speak Azerbaijani. So not only I did translation for them, but I regularly helped them with the analysis because I have to go through some newspaper articles in the country, let's say it's Azerbaijan or it's in Turkey, and see how that relates to our case. Well, those articles would be in Turkish, and the agents wanted to find out about some significance relevant to the ongoing uh, counterintelligence operations. So during my work with the FBI, I, I got to and I became aware of some really incredible operations and, and cases that were ongoing from 1996 all the way till February 2002. Therefore, after I blew the whistle, uh, the uh, FBI and the Justice Department and also the State Department, they wanted to make sure that none of the information I learned, and we are not talking about ongoing investigations that would be jeopardized or the special techniques for surveillance that would be you know, jeopardize if I were to talk, but the content and, and the operations themselves would not become public. And to prevent that, they basically, this is the Justice Department with the nudge and the push from the State Department invoked the state secret privilege in my case. Then they invoked it again uh, the second time when I was asked to testify on 9-11 case by the 9-11 family members. At the time, they had a lawsuit through this legal firm, and they wanted me to be one of their witnesses and testify on certain cases and issues. So the Justice Department stepped in again, and they said, no, she cannot testify. Everything about her is classified, including her languages that she speaks, the degrees she <laughs> has, the country she was born. The date of birth, they, they classified that. So I became the classified woman. Then when I wrote my first book after I finished it, this was a biography, nonfiction, because I held the highest level secret clearance for security clearance for the FBI, I was obligated to submit my manuscript before publication to the FBI and have them go through the entire manuscript, see if they see anything that they consider classified. So with their black marker, they would, you know, just cross that and say, well, this cannot be included in your book. Well, the process is supposed to be 30 days, and they have to respond to you with the redacted stuff. Do so you take it out or you challenge it, then you publish. Well, in my case, that did not happen, Lou. We 
We submitted it to the FBI. A month passed, two months passed, three months passed, nothing. Finally, I had to go and hire attorneys. The attorneys started contacting the FBI and the DOJ, and they were told that my entire book was classified. Therefore, they couldn't just oh. black out anything. And this is the book you have read. This is the book yes. that has been available for three years. Great book, by the way, Classified Woman. And it was Kafka-esque. We said, how could, they said, even the page number, <laughs> there is nothing in this book you can't publish. And we have actually official documents and letters from DOJ saying everything about, this, everything in this book is classified. At that point, I had to decide, do I, you know, back off and don't do it? Or do I say, this is ridiculous, let them arrest me and take me to court and show the court and the maybe uh, juries, the team of juries, how can a book, the entire book, be classified, okay? This would be worse than Fahrenheit or Bible, right? Well, I published it, and I waited to see what was going to happen as a result, and nothing happened because they truly constitutionally, not that that ever stops them <laughs> nowadays, they, they were not really able to do anything. But that was when the idea of writing a fiction was conceived, because as I was going through this process fighting to publish this book, I was told that if you write a fiction book, you don't have to submit it to the FBI or the Justice Department or the CIA. And I had that as my plan B and saying, well, if they come and they say they're going to take all these books off the market and et cetera, I would be forced to write fiction because I had to write. <laughs> I had to write the, you know, story or stories related to this particular area. So the idea was conceived at that point. And in fact, as soon as my book was published and a few months after that, when nothing happened, I began writing this book that will be available on a very important date. And that is the September 11, 2014, the 13th anniversary of 9-11. And it's more than symbolic for me. People, when they read this book, they realize the significance of it, of course. And so I wrote it, and the idea first, even to myself, sounded preposterous, you know, to sit down and, and write a novel. I never considered myself an author. I never thought I would sit down and write a novel, but somehow I convinced myself and ended up doing it, and court of public opinion would determine if it was a worthwhile effort or not, of course, and that remains to be seen. Well, Sabella, there's a lot of extremely important information in this book. Of course, it's it's uh, it's uh, fun to read it as a novel. It's uh, a thriller, as I said. It's worth it just on those grounds. But it's far more important than I don't want to put down the novel as a form. But I mean, this book is it's not just a novel. You're also in this novel telling the truth about a whole bunch of criminal activities by the government that have uh, horrific effects. Uh, of the sort of thing that are that's still going on today and maybe multiplied today to gin up new wars and new trouble all over the world. Tell us something about the plot of the novel and the sorts of things that you cover that you can only cover in the guise of a novel. Sure. The context for this novel, for this story, is based on Operation Gladio. Operation Gladio was an operation paramilitary false flag operation methods put in place during the Cold War. And this is by NATO and the United States intelligence agencies, specifically the CIA and, of course, Pentagon. So they put together these paramilitary units in various countries in order to use false flag operations mainly and other sorts of set up synthetic events in order to sway the public opinions on the Soviet Union and communism, etc. Well, you would assume that such an operation, and it's already confirmed, right? people were to go and Google Operation Gladio. Sure, no, it's, it's fact. It's an established yes. fact that we did engage, uh, and this is we, the United States, through NATO, through our paramilitary, and in many cases, criminal networks that we uh, employed, we set up a lot of false flag operations, false flag bombings, terrors, etc., in order to counter, uh, I mean, that was the premise, the uh, Soviets' power and their influence in the important critical region. Well, you'd assume that this operation would end after the Cold War ended. However, this operation didn't end, but it was expanded and modified mm -hmm. to fit the post-Soviet Union era, because you were looking after 1990, 1991, you were looking at this area, and this is Central Asia and Caucasus, where the future of energy and resources 
are located, okay? Because we know the Saudi Arabia's and their oil it has a limited time stamp on it. It's not going to be as relevant in 15 years from now, Saudi Arabia or even Iraq. The future of energy and resources and also the pipeline, if you consider Pepe Escobar's phrase, which I love, pipeline of stands, again, you're looking at this former Soviet Union state. So here we were with the Cold War ended, and we had us, the West, the United States, you have China, and you have, to a certain degree, weakened Russia, and saying, whoever gets the control of this region is going to be the imperial power starting from this point on. So just as Middle East was for almost, you know, more than half a century. And Middle East, why do you think we have put our bases in Saudi Arabia? How did that come about? Why did we install Shah in Iran? All the things we did in Middle East, installing puppet regimes, bringing about coups, all those things that we did was to control those nations that control the resources. I mean, some of our listeners here may recall the OPEC crisis in 1970s, for example. I mean, what could happen if some of these countries get together and defy the West and say, if you do this, we are going to put an embargo or we're going to make the prices of, you know, price of oil such and such. Well, people here almost went crazy. And they're like, we don't care how you get our oil gas to us, but get us to us cheap and we don't care what you do. So our government, and this is also United Kingdom as well, well, they focus on taking over these regimes, setting one against another to make sure things like that won't happen again. I mean, we had that incident, and we haven't had that incident since. It was all about energy and resources and the power. Who was the power? You know, who was the most powerful between the Soviet Union and the United States? Now, with the fall of the Soviet Union after 1991, we had the same situation, this time over former Soviet Union states, Azerbaijan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, and also the entire region, including Georgia, who was going to control this? Well, we had the Chinese, you know, with their billions of people and their dependence on energy. We have the semi-weakened Russians, and we had us. So between these three actors in the global chess game, each one had to do his or her own, you know, its own best to take over and have the dominance of this region. With China's modus operandi, and business style, what they usually do is they do it via money. They go and they cut a deal with a country. They do it currently in Africa, as we know. They do it in Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan. They say, okay, we put the railroad or the pipeline here, and we want the exclusive right to this particular gas or oil development, and and here we're going to give you $50 billion, et cetera, for the next five years. But as we know, China doesn't go and install military bases for this. How many military bases do you know that China has installed in Middle East or Africa or Central Asia or Caucasus, Lou? None. Yeah, That's not, not their method, okay? They just do straight business. You know, maybe shrewd business, but it's still business. That, to me, is you know pretty kosher. Then we had the Soviet Union. Soviet Union said, well, our comparative relative advantage is for the last 50 years, we had these state leaders because they were all part of the Communist Party and they were all elected or selected by the Soviet Union before the Cold War ended, and they were put in power. Plus, Russia had converted their language because the official language in those nations for the last more than a cent, half a century was Russian, their official government and school languages. So Russia relied on that, saying, well, we have cultivated these uh, power political power there. Therefore, we want to keep that. Well, for the United States, as we know, we like to do military uh, base installments, and we like to do more cowboy style. It was, there are few comparative advantage that we can use as our advantage uh, for this region. This is, again, Central Asia. And that is, even though Russia turned their language from uh, Turkic languages that they spoke previously to Russian, a lot of this you know, population in the area, they still consider themselves as Turkic heritage, okay? That's the same heritage as people in Turkey. And even though religion was forbidden, you know, internally, they had kept some of that loyalty to to Islam because the religion of the region, most of the region, not all of it, is Islam. 
The United States was in this position with NATO saying, how can we utilize the language that is on our side, the Turkic language and the Turkic heritage and Islam to sway them and get them further from Russia and on our side so that we can turn them into NATO members, put our military base there, and also to dominate their energy, their rich energy resources sector. Well, the plan that was conceived and put in place, which was the continuation of Operation Gladio, original Operation Gladio, was that we would use Islam and we would use language and we continue the previous Operation Gladio tactics in order to sway these countries, bring them to our side, put them in our camp, put our military bases, etc., which we started doing. Starting in 1996, with the help of the United States, with, under United States direction, we helped open over 350 mosques in Azerbaijan and other countries in the region. We started putting together some of these NGOs for de supposed development or education or human rights or feminism, whatever you want to call it, and we started putting our operatives on the ground in place in those countries. And we also, with the help of Turkish paramilitary units under NATO, we took over the Chechen faction and said, we are going to supply them with, you know, with arms and direct them and train them and, and create this terror incidents and separation from the Russian side using our Chechen paramilitary units. Further, we put in place some new religious, you know, like Al-Qaeda, supposed Islam-oriented or people who utilize misuse Islam for terrorism purposes. And if you go alphabetically through the list, you see a lot of those. All, all of those were, again, supplemented, directed, armed by the United States, NATO operatives, and also pawn countries such as Turkey. We actually put together some assassination attempts in the region. Initially, for example, in Azerbaijan, Aliyev, the father Aliyev, not the current president, was still being pro-Russian. And he initially refused to side with Turkey and NATO and the United States. Some of these tactics initially didn't work. What did we do? We took some of the mafia units from Turkey and hooked Aliyev's son and Aliyev's brother in major gambling scandal where they ended up owing something like 10 or $15 million. And then we publicized that scandal, okay, to weaken Aliyev. Not only that, there were two or three assassination attempts that were carried out again. And if you go and Google this, you see that culprits were some Turkish paramilitary units. These were unsuccessful attempts. So we put all sorts of pressures. And finally, by 1997, 1998, we took over Azerbaijan. As you know, Azerbaijan has been a candidate for, for NATO member for years. And they have been spending billions of dollars to fulfill the requirements to become a full-fledged NATO member. And of course, you know, we used to have Manus Air Base and also what in, you know, we put in place in Kyrgyzstan. So these were the operations, and a lot of things were involved in this, from drug trafficking, money laundering, bribery, assassination attempts, coup attempts, synthetic terror events in the region. All of these were being conducted under NATO's Operation Gladio, the next phase, the next phase being post-Cold War, post fall of Soviet Union. And of course, it involves a lot of false flag stuff. I mean, the original Gladio, I remember, had something to do with some, some bombings of train stations in Italy, for example. Absolutely. For various political reasons. Isn't the false flag terror uh, operation just sort of bread and butter to these people? Absolutely. Because we have firsthand experience with this. Look what 9-11 allowed happen. You know, we had, if you remember PNAC, the Project for New American Century, in 1999-2000, we had the shadow government and, and the government powers get together and say, how do we establish our dominance? And people can go and look up PNAC, P-N-A-C. They put together this paper and said, with the fall of the Soviet Union, here we have this great opportunity to become world power, okay? We want to be an empire. However, 
in order to make this happen, we need the public support in these, especially in the United States, but to a certain degree in other European countries. See, because psychologically speaking, after the fall of the Soviet Union, suddenly you had this missing motivation for the government to expand for military industrial complex expenditure, buying, you know, investing trillions of dollars in weapons, because for almost half a century, those activities, those expenditures, those operations were justified by the fear mongering that communists are out there, they are about to take over the world. And if we don't do this as the United States, they're going to come and take over. We're going to be invaded by the Russians. We're going to be invaded <laughs> yeah. even by Cubans. So we have to, we have to stockpile all these weapons and nuclear weapons. And people said, okay, in the United States, they are so scary. Do what you must to protect us. Well, you remove that threat in 1991. You're looking at the people, the psychology of people saying, whew, that's great. Now that we don't have that big, bad, evil Soviet Union and the Cold War and communists to fight against, let's concentrate about some of the internal stuff, you know, whether it's some of the things we are doing on education or, you know, uh, all sorts of other things, because we don't have that threat. Well, what would that mean for, let's say, the big corporations, military-industrial complex? Well, their bread and butter was the Cold War and the synthetic wars. And now we are in this situation for a brief period where we don't have that excuse to go and stockpile all these weapons, etc. Well, that was not acceptable, neither to the industry, the military-industrial complex, nor for a government that wants to be extremely big and powerful and be a police state, you know, how do you justify all this? How do you even justify as big of a CIA? CIA's existence creation was justified uh, based on Cold War. Now, they have to protect that term. And these guys, when they wrote this paper for PNAC, that was exactly what they said. They said, what we need to do is we need to get the Americans and the other countries in Europe to say there is a threat and it is deadly. It is so dangerous. It's imminent, okay? And we need to, it doesn't exist. We need to create this. Short of a catastrophic event to show people that there is even a bigger monster than Soviet Union, even worse than communists, some horrifying event has to take place. Lo and behold, a year later, we had 9-11 happening here. You know, the biggest terrorist event in our soil, okay? The one before that, the only one we had was Pearl Harbor. Well, 3,000 people lost their lives, and it was all over the media for months and months, the horror of it. And it accomplished everything PNAC wanted. It accomplished a huge government. We ended up creating TSA, Department of Homeland Security, several other intelligence agencies. We suspended our First Amendment right. We basically suspended the entire Constitution. We justified, I mean, right now, how do you think they are justifying NSA's illegal surveillance? There are these big, bad terrorists. And we made that threat much bigger than even communists, see, because with the communists, with the Soviet Union, you could at least point to a country or countries and say, here's their power in terms of military power, here is their number, here is where they are, and say, this is the enemy. With this, we created this invisible enemy that we could say they are all over the world. There may be hundreds of millions of them, there may be three of them. There is no way in this world for us to have an incident where the, you know, we have the enemy eliminated. With the Soviet Union, the Cold War ended, boom, it went away, and it was a huge panic moment for the military industrial complex and the big government. Now, why can't we create an enemy that could never, ever be eliminated? Because how could you point out and say, today we eliminated the last member of Al-Qaeda, Lou. So the war on terror officially ends today because we have eliminated Al-Qaeda completely. <laughs> there are no Al-Qaeda fetuses in anybody's womb. Okay, we even eliminated those. Thus, as of today, Everybody celebrate. We're going to eliminate Department of Homeland Security. We're going to end the surveillance because we have eliminated the terrorism and Al-Qaeda. That will never happen, right, Lou? Because we have this perpetual enemy and situation that we have created. It's invisible. It doesn't have a particular location or country. They are supposedly all over the world. And we don't even have anything to uh, really measure the strength. The government says they can blow us up. 
and we don't know if it's true or not. You know, how could you prove something that doesn't exist? You know, how do you prove that it doesn't exist and it doesn't exist? <laughs> so this was, again, consistent with the Operation Gladio the Stage B after the Soviet Union. And as you said, for that, a lot of things had to take place in the United States and continue to take place here and to a very small degree, maybe in Europe. You know, we had some incidents in the United Kingdom, too. And if you look at the powers, the actors involved in Operation Gladio post-Soviet Union, basically you're just going to see the United States, United Kingdom, you know, and that is the both Pentagon, you know, and United Kingdom, and you have NATO. And they so far have been milking the, the threat of an invisible enemy that cannot be estimated in terms of power, location, or numbers, and do a lot of things. Every single war we have had since 9-11 has been justified based on 9-11. Everything has to do with the Islamic terrorism and Al-Qaeda. And again, they are invisible. As I always ask people, I say, if you read in the newspaper, they say, the United States with the drone killed 20 Al-Qaeda members in Yemen. Nobody asks, how is it established that they are Al-Qaeda members? Because do, does anyone go after the fact, look at the bodies, turn over the corpses, take out their IDs? There it is. There's an ID here. It says, I'm an Al-Qaeda member. Here's my photo, and here's my Al-Qaeda number. <laughs> Well, how do you identify someone as Al-Qaeda member that is the drone to go and kill? How do you identify that you have killed the right people and report with such confidence? And that's our, of course, mainstream media. And as you know, in this book, there are sections that talks about the U.S. mainstream media, especially, and how they operate. Sabelle, if people, if people have not heard you before or have not read you before and are listening today, uh, they get just a taste of just how much you know how wise you are, how courageous you are, and all of us who are concerned about our diminishing freedoms and concerned about the warfare state and the surveillance state and the police state and all the rest of the horrors uh, headquartered in Washington, D.C., we all owe you a debt of gratitude. And I want to, of course, highly recommend your first book, Classified Woman, The Sibel Edmund Story, tremendous autobiography, but especially everybody, get a copy of The Lone Gladio, read it. First of all, it's it's very, very interesting just as a, as a novel, but it tells the truth about all the horrors that are going on under the table, uh, thanks to the government and its allies uh, in the, the crony capitalist military industrial complex, the Pentagon, the CIA, all the various, the NSA, all the various uh, so-called intelligence agencies. Their object is global domination. I mean, they actually intend to run every single part of the world, and uh, we're just the uh, cash cows for them, and we're to be crushed uh, if we say boo, that's what they like. So Sibel Edmonds is the kind of person who refuses to be crushed, won't be intimidated, tells the truth, alerts Americans who have the brains to listen to her about the things that are going on. So get a copy of The Lone Gladio, get a copy of Classified Woman. Sibel, thanks so much for everything you're doing. Thanks for coming on the show today. And all I can tell you is just keep it up. Thank you for having me back. And let me congratulate you for a great job you've been doing at Lou Rockwell's site because I visit it every day. And we always include your articles. And there are so many of them that are on exact same issues that we just discussed in our news roundup, which we do several times a week, because they all address the whole issue of the imperialism and also the issue of the police state the national security state and a big government that is there not for the interest of the people. So thank you very much for all you do. And thanks for having me on again, Lou. Thank you, Sabel. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Well, thanks so much for listening to the Lou Rockwell Show today. Take a look at all the podcasts. There have been hundreds of them. There's a link on the LRC front page. Thank you. <laughs>